Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'll tell you what, I updated Jitsi over here. Uh, it sounds like you updated it over there, and it is just a bit different view for me today. So uh, I'm doing well. Everything's just kind of different. How are you doing over there? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty good. Uh, I, I think this is actually going to be pretty cool because now I can uh, more granularly manage how large we are. Um, and me being the uh, the narcissist I am, uh, I've, I've made us uh, really large. So that's going to be fun to see the difference in the videos. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I had recently updated Jitsi as well too. Uh, and, and here's a pro tip uh, to everyone who's, who's running a, a Linux distro as a desktop. Um, don't sudo pip install anything uh, lest your system-wide package manager uh, get upset with you and refuse to update. Oh, that does not sound great. <laughs> I've even isn't I mean, there a warning? Isn't there a warning there that is, says explicitly is, yes. do not run pip as sudo? <laughs> That's super easy. That's really there cool. is now. I'm lucky Man. to be running an ArchBase distro where a lot of those packages are available. Though they're they're packaged uh, by various maintainers. But if you want to run something like Red Hat or Ubuntu maybe, and you're trying to be bleeding edge, right? You're not going to be able to install that with the system package manager. So you're going to have to be more intelligent about the way that you set up some of your, your processes, especially if you're using it as a server. You're like, oh, I need this dependency, right? That's when you start using virtual environments and stuff. And I actually followed the rabbit trail down because Manjaro is very good at, at giving a um, place for people to... Uh, show what happened on a specific update so they have a thread um, all about issues that people have ran into and like a summary even at the top and uh, the response to the issue I was having was uh, RTFM which was the arch wiki and sure enough it just said remove all the, the files and try again and, and that worked so how about that <laughs> but, I, I mean it's, it's weird it's weird because I've been in this game a while you know, I've been I've been running Linux on the desktop since 2014, 2015, maybe, and I've just gotten used to these type of things. Now I've gotten burned before, don't get me wrong, but I've I've learned my lesson and and have an idea of oh okay, someone tells me to remove you know all of the packages inside of a directory of user lib, right? I probably shouldn't just remove them. I should probably move them somewhere else. Um, check first or what does it verify but yeah 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 uh, trust but, but verify, verify. Yeah. yeah trust but verify yeah so you know move moving them over and then and then really understanding what that do that's doing because like if i move over the wrong libraries then my python based package manager won't work so i have to make sure that you know the ones i'm moving over aren't the ones that it needs to function Hey, don't straight delete these. We might need them. Exactly. Now, in, in all else goes wrong, I'll still have, you know, rsync and, and the move command. I can put them back. Uh, so it, it's just it's just little things like that where I think, you know, if I don't have, if I hadn't had the experience that I, I have, I wouldn't have necessarily known what to do in that scenario. And and that's that's just something I think is really cool. Being in the job that I'm in, being exposed to this so much, uh, that something like that for me is second nature. And I know it's not for everyone. And I know people will, will, will look down at, at those kind of issues and say, well, there's no, there's no default way to fix stuff like that. And I'm like, well, no, there's not, because you have to be wise about it. You have to you, you have a modicum of intelligence on, uh, as to how you deal with it. And what do you mean? I can't just upgrade <laughs> without <laughs> checking dependencies. <laughs> well, and I'm even worse too. I don't. I don't even read release notes. I need to get in that habit, you know. But just send it off. Just, just like, yep, looks great. Just <laughs> let's uh, let's yo low ourselves yo into a in, into an update. So, man, always always something to do better, I guess. But that's a tangent that I didn't think I was going to get into today. Uh, because we do have plenty of articles, uh, actually, Jack, that you had uh, selected quite a few for us. So if you want to, to start telling the uh, the story of burnout and woe. Sure, I would love to. Honestly, 
the one this article this first article uh it's titled the burden of an open source maintainer i didn't really like the title because i don't think it's burnout i think it's just kind of overload uh on this one guy jeff gearing here he wrote this article put it out uh came out pretty recently fine january and he's just writing about basically how he maintains a plethora of projects he says he maintains over 200 projects he's a top contributor <laughs> and he gets 50 to 100 emails a day basically saying hey can you merge my pr in or can you look at my pr and the one thing that struck out to me on this entire article article uh it was kind of upsetting to see you get these maintainers uh, out there and you see this guy he's working 200 projects right that, that's a lot to deal with i think between you and me we have 10 uh, you know breaking that down that's still a decent amount if you think about drive-by contributions and people just pushing up saying hey look this fix this is something that fixed my issue and it's you know something in depth something that's not code something that's or something that is code something that's not just oh it's an update for the readme i updated a spell you know you spelled something wrong something that actually requires kind of an in-depth look at it's unfortunate to see PRs go stale, uh, merger quests that just are left to go stale, and issues that you know if people aren't following up, they the guy this Jeff says he just lets the stale bot take care of it, and it's like well look the issue could still exist, but just because I didn't write that it's you know comment hey this is I'm still encountering this, it doesn't mean it's not there anymore. They just don't go away, so a little bit unfortunate to see. I wish there was just a little bit more contribution i think is what i would what i would like so uh i just want to get more involved i think with kind of maintaining the projects and doing doing better and so i've started to look into rails more and core ruby uh that's one of my goals for this year on um seeing what i can do to actually contribute and not just use the project report the issues and go about my way it's it's certainly hard to come to a balance of contributing to open source and consuming open source because you 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 don't want to keep pushing stuff for example on jeff right you, you right. want what you're doing to be meaningful valuable right right and for if, everybody if you just do something there's a chance that that something isn't valuable so so making sure that that something is valuable takes a whole nother level of sophistication and, and, and thought put into what you're doing, um, which which hopefully doesn't distract you from the thing you're trying to do in the first place, which is use it, right? And it's frustrating. I, I get it for a lot of these, these tooling, so like languages specifically, because you're using those languages to do other things which also right. take up your time um, yet the core language development itself uh, takes up time it you know for other people um, so he jeff here has several different ways to to mitigate that one just ruthlessly kind of closing prs uh, when they're when they're not needed um and and uh, keeping what was it? What was the second thing? The stale bot, basically yeah. keeping issues. If, yeah. if issues aren't commented on within a certain time period, they're basically automatically closed out. Which is another unfortunate one, just because an issue was reported and it's not commented on doesn't mean it just magically goes away. Now, the one thing I'll say that he did comment at the very beginning. I don't know if you saw it. Is the fact that the way I think, and now this is very specific to him, uh, not all open source projects, but he says he makes it very, I think he said pluggable. I'm going to have to find it in here, but he says he makes uh, his project, the projects basically as open as possible and as, as pluggable. Like if you can basically just plug in mm -hmm. as, as easy as possible. So pretty, pretty agnostic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's a good strategy is what, I kind of took away from that. And it's it's weird because the, the first thing that you would think is, all right, well, build out some kind of a community around something or, or, or a support model where you have people that, you know, you're not the only one to to work on this. But, you know, you look at you look at Linus and, and really it's the same thing. I mean, the buck stops with the maintainer, 
right? So it doesn't matter how many people you have working with you, right? You, you can still put yourself in that position of, of burnout if you don't take the appropriate measures. Um, and and even under your, your second model, I mean, that is a team of people who are trying to right. avoid burnout, right? So, so the second article here uh, is talking about why uh, Bolt.com uh, switched to a four-day work week, right? Why, why they're going through that, what they, they hope to, to fix and, and kind of rethink um, working in 2022. Yeah, that one was pretty interesting. I, I told you before the show or during the pre-show here, the most interesting quote I took away from the entire article was, uh, here's what many of us know but can be tough to admit, which is a terribly written sentence uh, or terribly written half sentence. But basically it's work will fill the space you give it to. So basically they mm-hmm. said, look, we're going to do Monday through Thursday and you take, if you don't have, it sounded like they're going to four day week, but if you have to come in on Friday to do stuff, you have, you, you know, you're coming in on Friday to do that. But Honestly, if you say, all right, look, I'm not coming in. I don't want to come in on Friday. Then you're going to try and get all of your work done Monday through Thursday so you can have the, the whole day free. So that's kind of what I took away from it. I know you also mentioned before uh, during the pre-show the conscious.org if you want to go into that one. Well, uh, they've touch got on that a, a little bit. They've got a lot of resources there. I, I haven't gotten the ability to dive in, but it looks like like a lot of what we've been talking about, you know, how to be a, a mindful leader. Um, how to work efficiently. They even have something in there about inbox zero, but that's not what I wanted to focus on here. I wanted to focus on, you know, they're, they're trying this new thing to prevent burnout, right. As, as a team, which is, which is different from, from preventing burnout as an individual, because you don't have necessarily have a, a person where the buck stops, especially with a, with a small internal team like this. The, the thing I'm wondering is, what do you think about making it a three day weekend, right? Rather than having a four day work week, specifically calling out that the weekend is three days in a row. The days off are, are three days in a row and the days on are four days in a row. What do I specifically think of that? If you have an opinion, I mean, yeah. I don't, I hadn't, I, I don't have a comment or an opinion on that. I mean, so I there think, was there. Yeah. Go ahead. I and, and and I may, right? I'm not sure that I have a, a good one, but but I have certainly looked into this before, you know. And and what they call out here is right. I mean, they they are adopting this approach because they believe that it will, you know, cut uh, unnecessary communications. That they're going to trim out excess meetings. Um, they'll get more concrete work done during the time that they do have, uh, which are touted as uh, advantages to, to this kind of system. However, it's, it's not true flexibility. And as we know, one of the things that motivates people is autonomy, right? And part of autonomy right. is the ability to be flexible. And as we've seen, a lot of people uh, enjoy the work from home ethic because they can log in when they need to they can uh you know come back and and do things when it's kind of quieter for them rather than uh i have to stay at work until a set time and then rush home to get little jimmy to soccer practice and then go to little Susie's dance recital and then come home and then i can't do anything until the next morning right that that's that's not been what's been going on the past two years the past two years it's kind of been a state of, of flux where people are able to get what they need to done when they have the ability to do so, or at least in most of the technical spaces here. Um, one of the things I heard from CGP Gray uh, is that he likes to have like a weekend Wednesday, right? And then take like a Saturday or Sunday off, whatever's kind of more advantageous for him, right? So he's still taking two days off and having five days on, but but he's mixing it up. He said he's he's really found uh, it, it, it comfortable for him to have a break in the middle of the week to just stop with the work stuff and do the, do the home stuff that he's been putting off yeah. at. Um, and then, 
you know, if if Saturday is the day he needs to go running around or, or Sunday or, or even both, right? He has the flexibility to do that. Now, that's a little bit different because he is kind of working for himself. He has that flexibility where he is beholden to him and a small team of people who are just working to, to get their, their, their stuff done. The, the downside with that in a more structured environment like this, and, and, and I'm just bringing this up because I'm pinging off both sides of the fence here, the the availability, and, and they actually do mention this at, at conscious.org, but the ability to be available when people need you, right, to, to not have that 100% capacity, if you're doing that, that floating type of work where you're just going in and working when you need to work, uh, you're going to have... 100% of the time that you sit down to work taken up, right? You're not going to have any free capacity. You're not going to have any free cycles. You're not going to have any downtime that you can spend with other people or to be available for other people. Uh, you know, as, as, as well, and, and this has been a problem for distributed teams for a while, you know, how, how do you communicate in an expedient type of manner when people are on at different times of the day, right? right. It's, it's very helpful for when you are all at the office at the same time, or even just all logged into the VPN at the same time to know that you can ping someone during normal business hours and, and they're, they're kind of expected to be available. Exactly. Right. Right. So there are, there are, there are ways that th I, I think this will help uh, the, the mentality of the team to, to, to be more productive, to be able to have, you know, more relaxing, fulfilling weekends uh, and, and, and to have that get that personal time back. Uh, and and I also believe that there are alternatives to this. Right. And, and just kind of laying out one that that that, for instance, you could take a Wednesday off and, and have a floating day to work, you know, doing something like that. Uh, could also work in other scenarios. So I'm not saying that this is the end all be all for four day work week, but I think it is a very interesting experiment. And, and that's what they call it here. They call it an experiment. Uh, they're, they're testing the hypothesis and, and doing so, they say, with an organization that has big goals, a growing team and a lot on the line. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited that they chose to do this. And, and I look forward to seeing more companies take this approach in the future. I'm interested to see that as well. I'm inter just interested to see is, as this company grows or doesn't, for that matter, as is it, it is a startup, to see if they end up going from a four-day work week to a more traditional, or I say traditional, if they end up switching back saying, hey, look, we thought we were going to see a lot better results. We actually didn't. So definitely would like to see you, you always hear about the success right you never hear no one really ever hears about the failure for everything so i don't know if you know it's hard to post a failure like hey we went to four day weeks and guess what no one was available on friday and we had some developer push something out on a friday or whatever well, but yeah or, it'll be interesting to see or use that for for another purpose so i'm gonna i'm gonna launch into our next article that is is seemingly uh a a a big difference from what we've been talking about, but I promise I'm going to bring it back because uh, the, the the last one we have here is that LastPass uh, confirms that there was a credential stuffing attack uh, against some of its users. Right. So the uh, credential stuffing attacks, uh, they say here in the article from the record.media. So, I mean, yeah. It's a source, but they have a good explanation here. They say credential stuffing attacks have been a pretty common occurrence. Uh, these type of attacks uh, are aimed at, at big online services, right? Wherein they, uh, they have uh, a, a database of passwords that has been uh, leaked somehow. Uh, usually it's been like uh, a, 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 uh, disconnected, not disconnected, but like a, a, a different services uh, service got hacked or its or its credentials got hacked, right? And and those have been reverse engineered, right? We talk about when you have the hash of, of someone's password, even if you hash it, you can rainbow attack it. And then someone who has a uh, fairly uh, insecure password is, is going to have that broken, right? Um, so what, what happened with LastPass 
is that someone someone found these and then subsequently tried to log into LastPass with some of these credentials. The problem is that some of that worked. So what, what 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 does that tell us, right? So if these attackers have gotten credentials, so username and passwords from some other data breach, and they're now trying those same credentials against LastPass, it means that the the people using this LastPass service were using the same password to log into this other service that got hacked. Which is the wrong thing to do, like, to be honest. If you have a password manager, why, in fact, are you using the same password for your password manager as all your other services? Exactly. Exactly. Like, that's that's a big question. And there are plenty of ways that people could have could have gotten there, right? But the, the problem I've seen with, with a lot of these attacks against, let's, let's call them normies or you know just just things that you wouldn't think about is that it's really easy you know if i've already had a password forever for all my other services and i sign up for this password manager service let me just use the password that i've been using for all of my other services with this one and going forward sure i can I can Update do them. the necessary sure. thing i can i can create new passwords for all my new services but It'd be, you know, a minor inconvenience to go back and change my old services to use a new generated password, right? What What's the average user have? 270 passwords? It's going to be a massive inconvenience. That's two days of straight signing into services and changing it, basically. Exactly. But, yeah. And, and that's, that's not, you know, the only type of way to, you know, quote unquote, secure yourself online, right? There's, there's tons of little things here and there that... You know, it's it's almost like brushing your teeth before you go to bed. I mean, you, you just kind of got to do it over and over. Or you know, in this password thing, password managers, you have to you have to take that approach and actually migrate passwords over to to better, more secure passwords, right? But having the mental capacity to deal with that necessarily means that you have to not be burnt out, right? You have to have the bandwidth to protect yourself online. And protecting yourself online is the same as protecting yourself in the real world. It takes effort. You can't expect to expend all your effort during the work week or on maintaining open source projects and then be able to come back and have a secure web presence. I mean, that's just not going to happen, right? Right. So as as much as it seems like we really nitpick on, you know, um, open source maintainers or, or, or companies you know, making the most and, and, and being as flexible as, as they possibly can, right? The reason we're doing this is because it benefits us all by having them not get hacked, right? And, and as well as, you know, it, many, many other advantages, but at least, you know, they're able to to step back, you know, and, and if you're able to get that personal time, I'd actually probably prioritize that, right? And then maybe that extra time you have from that, you know, one day a week that you gain by transitioning to a four day work week, you can now spend mentally going over, all right, how my finances, right? How is my security online? Right. You know, did I just stuff, normal human stuff that people forget that creeps up on you. You're right. able to to have the mental capacity to deal with that, which, which you aren't if you're overworked, if you're overstressed, if you're burnt out. Um, so I guess balance is, is the main the main thrust of this this uh, this intro this this uh, this part of the show. I was gonna say you really roped it all back together. I like that. Um, we can jump into. We have some news and community updates. Nothing compared to the intro. That's why I kind of added a bunch of articles for the intro. Yeah. We have two dollar bar updates and one Firefly three update. Honestly, all three were just minor. Uh, and then I didn't see anything else across the services. With Dollbar, they entered into their 14.0 maintenance release. And so, then I see here Firefly 5.6.10. So just keep it on top yep. of those. So that's good. And then those two are out there. And then I did include there's a second one uh, for Dollbar, which was the 2021 retrospective. And I know that you love your infographics. Mm. So they put one together that I thought was pretty good. Ooh. They have this nice infographic basically on uh lines of code contributed uh their growth on socials you know how many 
apps, I think, or add-ons were added. And Look then at this, downloads. Though. Look at this, though. External modules available on the dollar store, right? Which is kind of like their app store. Yeah. They had 902 editions, right? That's a that's, lot. That's a lot. But that is only a 19% bump. So. <laughs> There's, I did not appreciate the magnitude of external modules that were available if 900 of them only bumped it less than 20 percent 20 percent what does that mean there are 5,000 already out there i math but that that's a lot more than i thought but yeah i thought that one was pretty interesting just because you don't see i mean how often do you see uh kind of like retro like this a uh I forget what they called it. Yeah, retrospective of 2021. Yep. Main indicators of the year. They're at least tracking it. They have it. So Very cool. Good to see. And we um, don't have a retro, but we do have developments uh, that we accomplished yeah. in the, the intervening two weeks between our last episode and, and this one. Uh, so we have, let's see, two instance features that I noted down here. Uh, one of them was the ability to migrate data from local to remote storage. Uh, this is like step one of seven in our plans of adding external volumes uh, onto uh, instances so that we can expand storage uh, pretty much infinitely uh, so that whatever you need to have available up there, however much you need to have available up there is able to be made available. Specifically, this is going to come in handy for Nextcloud, uh, you know, uploading videos, uh, pictures, what have you. Um, now, as a, to take a step back and to put on like a, a consultant type hat, uh, one of the, the interesting case studies I've seen is the way that Jupiter Broadcasting put together their instance because they are obviously very tech savvy people. You know, they run several Linux podcasts and, you know, have for at least a decade, if not two, if not more. And their approach that they've taken is to use a cloud instance of Nextcloud, uh, you know, on, I think they maintain it on Linode, to use that as their uh, hot swap Nextcloud instance, like where they keep the last three months worth of, of information there, uh, and then subsequently archiving that, and they have a, they have multiple local servers, you know, that, that they can use and, and use as storage. But that setup uh, is cost effective uh, because that accessibility in the cloud really only gets you an ROI when you're using it, right? Um, if you need to dig it up, you certainly want to have it available, but the likelihood that you're going to need to to grab that, you know, versions and versions of versions past when it was actually relevant is, is certainly diminishing. Um, so the, the ability to archive that and, and just keep what's necessary in the cloud is going to maximize uh, the, the cost savings um, that, right. that right. will bring you while still maintaining a uh, access to those files. Uh, but who knows what three months looks for for an individual, it could be, you know, 10 gigs, could be 100 gigs, could be 500 gigs. Who knows? Uh, but we're taking steps towards being able to handle that. Um, and I ran into a really interesting thing that Jack and I went over in Ansible, where in include role was trying to evaluate a grandparent's role via dependency. So like a dependency of a dependency had an include role in it. And the, the very first uh, role that, that started that dependency chain had a conditional. Well, of course, the variable that that conditional is being called isn't going to be available in the, the very last include role statement. Right. But, but it was trying to evaluate it just because of the internals of what Ansible pulls forward. So uh, we had to work around that, uh, so that was interesting. You'll 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 see that in the the PR that was raised for that specific one. Uh, just just an you know another one of those idiosyncrasies, and you're gonna find it in any language, right? And that's just something you get used to as you you know work day in day out in in any type of language. But uh, 
it, it was just an interesting one to me. I actually have already talked it uh, about it ad nauseum, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. But it was it was interesting to to walk through that and and uh, to be able to strip everything away and and produce a a, a minimum kind of reproducer uh, set of uh, playbooks Here, and roles. Yeah. 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 Uh, to be so it, it it took up a lot of my time but i was i was happy that now i have an even better understanding and might i add a documented in the code understanding of how this works and why this has to be as it is um and then jack also was able to uh, to work on some of the application views or at least the yeah, status I- one as we've mentioned, I think over the past couple episodes, just getting the application views all together here. I think last week was logs. This I should say last episode was logs. This episode is the status of it. And now the interesting thing we have now with Portal for the application views is that now instead of seeing one status that says healthy for all the apps, when in fact one could be unhealthy, you're going to see specific individualized statuses for these services. And then you know, if one's unhealthy, it's only going to run a fix on itself. It's not going to run it against the entire instance. So exciting to see that. Uh, just one more small thing as we work towards 4041 here yeah. um, for Portal. The environment, and, get ready for that one. Yeah, that, and that's it, coming up next year. Yeah, and a, and a couple fixes to that resiliency, you know, as we march forward to 4.1, right? Um Talking about defense in depth, uh, right? This this wasn't necessarily a, a huge issue, but there was uh, a, a password that we kept on the droplet that we really didn't need to, right? Uh, it was really only used when we ran the specific backup command that we needed to. So that being the case, why not just remove it when it's it's unneeded? So you know, if an instance does have something. In, happened to it that's not just sitting there so um i was i was happy to get that implemented just as a little bit of technical data it should have been that way the entire time but wasn't uh the other couple things are adding a single volume within without inputting the droplet id right uh and 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 the block volume maintenance so these were uh more things towards that ability to to scale um, and at the end of the day, what we ended up with is is a declarative way uh, to set the size uh, of the remote storage on an instance. So if you need an extra 10 gigs of hex or 500 gigs, whatever, right? There's no math that anyone has to do. Uh, the, the code will just say what's existing, what needs to be there, and it will figure out what to do, uh, which is how it should be. Uh, so, so moving towards that more declarative type of functionality. 